Hey everyone, Sam here. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. So I'm quite literally parked up at the side of a country road and editing this video in the car. And I thought, well, it's such a nice day that I'll just film the intro out here. It is still winter here in Northern New Zealand, but it's actually quite warm when the sun comes out. So nice to get out in the fresh air. So in this video, I'm going to show you this large landscape that I painted. It features the Rees Valley in Southern New Zealand. And if you've watched any of my other YouTube videos, you'll see that a few months ago, I painted a smaller version of this. Now I often paint small artworks, particularly eight by tens or 10 by 12s, for example. And the ones that I particularly like, I use them as studies for larger paintings, which is what I did with this one. So in this video, I'll show you some of the process of painting this landscape, and I'll give you some tips on creating atmospheric perspective in landscapes in general, how to mix some of those colors and values, and just general tips on landscape painting. So sit back, relax, and let's roll the tape. I'm painting on a 30 inch by 40 inch Belgium linen stretcher. I begin sketching out the composition with a number five flat brush and burnt sienna and some gum turps. So I'm just marking in the major planes and vectors within the scene. As I sketch out the composition, I'll just explain a bit of the process of how I arrived at being able to start a big painting like this. You see, when I actually get into a big painting like this, there's quite a bit of planning that's gone into it beforehand. And it all starts with my sketchbook, so with small thumbnail sketches, and then I arrived at a final sketch. Once I had my final sketch ready, I then painted a small artwork of this scene. And if you've been watching my YouTube channel for a while, I actually made a video on painting this mountain landscape, and I've put the link in the description below. Now I often paint small artworks, especially 8x10s and 10x12s, just because I can paint them quite quickly. Then if there's a painting that I particularly like that I think will make a nice large artwork, then I'll use that as a study for creating the scene. And painting small artworks or colour studies, first of all, are a really good way of seeing the road ahead. Because if you're going to get into a large artwork, you may have a great idea for it, but the last thing you want to do is be halfway through your painting and you just suddenly realise that the landscape that you're creating just doesn't work or it doesn't translate well into a painting. And that can be very frustrating, and believe me, that's happened to me many times. So creating a small artwork first, a small painting or a colour study, is really helpful in this process. Now, as I said, I'm sketching out the composition with some burnt sienna and gum terps here. The medium I used for this painting is mainly liquid, which is an alkyd resin. And what it does is it thins and improves the flow of the paint and speeds up the trying time. I'm using oil paints here, but you could just as easily paint something like this in acrylics as well, because all the principles of colours, values, atmospheric perspective, it's just as applicable. The colours I used in this painting included titanium white, burnt sienna, yellow oxide, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, quinacridone crimson, this was a substitute for alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue and thalo green. Now, since painting this artwork, I've actually switched brands of paint and I've started using a brand called Blue Ridge Oils, which are just absolutely beautiful to use. So if you want to get your hands on some Blue Ridge Oil paints, I've put the link to their website in the description box below. So I've sketched out the composition and it's now time to start slinging some paint at this thing. The first thing I do, which is what I do with all of my paintings, is to identify where all the dark values and shadows are within the scene first of all, because this is going to allow me to quickly create a tonal dynamic within the painting, and it's then going to make it much easier for me to get the colours correct and the values correct and create that atmospheric perspective. For example, making sure that the mountains in the distance look like they're in the distance. So value refers to how light or dark a subject is, and in general, in landscapes, you'll find your darkest darks and your lightest lights in the foreground. Whereas in the distance, darks are not as dark and lights are not as light, and this is because the value scale narrows. So something I learned from plain air painting from some other artists is always paint your darks first, and I definitely agree with that. 
So I started off here with the distant mountains and the shadows here are a kind of a mid-tone bluish violet colour. In order to create this I mix ultramarine blue, burnt sienna with a little bit of quinacridone crimson and some titanium white. The burnt sienna being a dark orange helps to desaturate the blue so that the blue is not as vibrant and it means that it will sit back in the distance. Now saturation is how intense the colour is, it's also known as chroma as well. And in the distance of a landscape we're going to be using much lower chroma colours because if they're too saturated they're going to jump forward. So as I paint the shadows in the mountains and the edges of the river banks where there's lots of mountain stones and scree that's collected on the side there, I'm making the shadows darker but I'm using the same paint mixture but with much less titanium white so that this is going to darken the value. And one thing I'm conscious of in my paintings is I try and use similar colours throughout and this helps to create colour harmony within the painting, meaning that the painting will read well to the viewer. This is part of the reason why I use fewer colours on my palette and go for a more limited palette in general. Using a limited palette will also help you with your colour mixing and help you to understand colour much better. It also means I'm more likely to be using all of those colours throughout the painting. The shadows in these southern beech trees here are a mix of ultramarine blue and yellow oxide and trees are the darkest values to be found in the landscape so I want to create some dark tones here. So I mark these in and I'm mainly using number 10 and number 8 flat brushes. Not only so I can achieve that gestural painterly effect but also cover ground quickly. So at this point my shadows are marked in and you'll see that I've got my darkest shadows more towards the foreground, contrast against those lighter shadows in the mountains in the distance. And then what I do after that is I work back to the farthest zone away which is the sky and then I'll work my way forward. So the sky is a mix of ultramarine blue with some titanium white and just a small amount of phthalo green that's going to shift the hue of that blue to a more almost turquoise blue. I don't want my blue to look too green so if that's the case I'll just mix in some more ultramarine blue. I then mark in the areas of the mountains that are in full sunlight and I'm using the same colours that I used in the shadows which was a mix of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, a bit of quinacridone crimson and titanium white but I've gone much heavier on the burnt sienna to make the value lighter and more of a warm grey. But by using the same colours here it's going to sit harmoniously with the shadows. Those distant forests on the side of the mountain are a mix of ultramarine blue with yellow oxide, a small amount of burnt sienna and some titanium white. We've really got to keep the greens desaturated in the distance so that they sit back in the landscape. Then as I work my way forward I'm using combinations of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, titanium white, a bit of quinacridone crimson and even warming up some of these neutral greys that I'm mixing with some yellow oxide. I vary the mixtures here and just create some texture within the side of the mountain so these could be exposed rock faces or exposed dirt. It all adds interest and variety within the painting. I keep my colours in check here making sure that they're not too saturated and this is where knowledge of the colour wheel is important because in general if we mix two colour opposites with each other then they cancel each other out and this is how we can desaturate colours. Now I have made a video on colour mixing basics and I'll put the link to that in the description as well but if you go through my videos as well you'll see it there. So next I'm going to start painting the beech trees on the side of the mountain here and I'm going to shift the colour up a gear and increase the saturation of the green. So this is mainly a mix of ultramarine blue with yellow oxide, some cadmium yellow which is really going to boost the chroma of the colour. And then I'll round off the mixture with some quinacridone crimson or even some cadmium orange. I don't mix my colours together thoroughly because I like some of those individual hues to come through. But I mark in the main areas of the trees. Overall I'm going to be keeping this painting relatively loose and gestural. I'll certainly be adding more details to it later on. But when this painting's viewed from a distance it's going to look reasonably detailed anyway. Once I've marked in these mountain beech trees I then move on to the grass and this is mostly a mix of again the same colours. Ultramarine blue with yellow oxide, cadmium yellow, a bit of cadmium orange or burnt sienna and titanium white. So 
The valley of the grass is generally some of the lighter values to be found in the landscape and much lighter than the trees. So this is really important because otherwise the grass will get lost in the trees and we want those trees to stand out. So keep the valley of the grass lighter. Now as I work into the grass in the distance, this is much lighter in value and lower in chroma. So there's been plenty of titanium white used. I've also mixed in a little bit of thalo green as well, which is a good color to sort of kick up the saturation. You don't want to use too much of it because it's a very strong color, but it's really good for creating some rich grass greens. I paint the river with a mix of ultramarine blue, a little yellow oxide, a little thalo green and titanium white. I'm keeping in mind also that the river is reflecting the sky, but I've found that a lot of rivers in New Zealand are quite bright turquoise blue. I don't know if that's something to do with the minerals that are in it or I'm not really sure, but some of them are really vibrant and beautiful in this country. The section of the river in the foreground is in shadow, so I've gone darker on the blue here. So I've mixed in more ultramarine blue into my mix as well as yellow oxide. I paint the snow on the distant mountains with a mix of titanium white, some ultramarine blue, burnt sienna and a little quinacridone crimson because I want to make the value a bit darker. I don't want to go straight into using titanium white from the tube because otherwise I'm going to have nowhere to go with my values. I want to build those up a bit as well so that I'll be saving my lightest mountain highlights right until the very end. But even then they won't be completely white because I want those mountains to sit in the distance. So my snow mix is going to have a little bit more burnt sienna in it, which will help it to sit back in the distance. The stones and scree at the edge of the river banks here is a very light value, low chroma colour. And again, a mix of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, titanium white and a bit of quinacridone crimson. And you'll notice that I've been using these colour combinations a lot throughout the painting. So this is going to help to create the colour harmony because I'm using similar colours. I really try and keep my colour mixing simple. You really don't need to overcomplicate it at all. Now, once I've marked in these main zones within the painting, I then go back across the whole thing and restate the dark. So re-emphasise in the shadows and dark values within the scene. And that's really going to start to bring it to life. Now one thing with landscape paintings is having shadows within them always communicates a more three-dimensional form and if you're learning to paint landscapes you'll find this much easier to create realistic looking landscapes. Now that's not to say that you can't create realistic landscapes when the sun's shining directly on them or it's on a day where it's particularly cloudy or misty or foggy for example, but that's where having a real good grasp of your colours and values is really going to come into play. So if you're learning to paint landscapes, start off with painting landscapes that have got lots of shadows and full sunlight on it, such as this painting here. Whenever I block in a painting, I like to do it all in one go, and then I can see if it's working, if my colors are working, the values work. And then really after that, it's just layering detail over the next few sessions as I'm working on the painting. And you can go as detailed or as loose as you like. I prefer to keep my paintings a little bit more on the loose side because I like my paintings to look alive and atmospheric, but you could go much more detailed. But my paintings would always start off this way. The painting is dry and what I did was I worked on this painting over a few weeks, not consistently, but a good few hours sessions here and there. And I focus on individual zones within the painting. And when you're doing a painting like this, I think that's the easiest way to do it. So to start with, I focused on the sky and the background mountains, just building up the details there. Using smaller brushes now, mainly number five flat brushes. Now the brushes I'm using here are made by a company called Rosemary & Co. And they're based in the UK and they ship brushes worldwide. So I've been using their brushes for a few years now. They're really nice to use. They're also not too expensive, which is great. And if you want to get hold of some of them, I've put a link in the description box below. Now I work my way forward in the painting, adding more details, readjusting some of those shadows, adding more shadows to the trees on the left side of the painting, the beech tree forest there. 
And what I'm doing is I'm building up details, but also with each progressive pass, I'm adding lighter layers as well. So I'm gonna be saving my lightest values until the very end of the painting, which I do with all of my paintings. So this is what will make the painting truly come alive when we're adding those final light values. In this painting, I spent a bit of time working on the water and it was my original intention to have it a bit more calm, but I found once I'd painted that, it didn't look that interesting. So later on, I changed it up and made the water much more turbulent, adding a few more ripples and small waves. I spent time working on the trees on the right side of the painting, which are mostly in shadow, but then there's some sunlight skirting across the tops. And this is mainly a mix of ultramarine blue with yellow oxide, cadmium yellow and titanium white and then I round off the colour with some quinacridone crimson. And the red in the quinacridone crimson is just going to help balance out the green. So if your green's looking a bit too artificial or a bit too neon, then round off your mix with a colour that contains a colour that is opposite to green on the colour wheel, i.e. red. So this could be something like a burnt sienna, a quinacridone crimson, a cadmium orange, even a cadmium red if you're using that. Something that contains red. Now, as I said, I built up the detail in this painting over a few sessions, but in general, I'm pretty much using the same colour mixes as I was using during the blocking in stage. The only difference being is that I was adjusting the values. So in some cases, darker values where I was working on the shadows and mostly lighter values in the rest of the areas in the full sunlight. And as I said, I'll be building the layers up. So I'm adding my lightest layers at the very end of the painting. It's my personal opinion that value is actually a bit more important than the colours that you're using. I mean, we definitely want to get our colours correct and make sure that they're not too saturated in places where they shouldn't be, i.e. say the background mountains, for example. But really it's the values that are going to help create that atmospheric perspective. So as I said earlier, we're going to find our darkest darks in the foreground as well as our lightest lights. But then as we move into the distance, darks are not as dark and lights are not as light. Now towards the end of this painting, I was mainly focusing on the river, building up the texture to communicate the turbulent, fast flowing water. I really enjoyed painting this landscape. And if you wanna learn more about painting landscapes in general, then subscribe to my channel and click the thumbs up button. All helps with the YouTube algorithm, however that works. If you'd like to learn more about landscape painting, particularly if you're a beginner, then check out the free painting resources I have on my website at samuelerp.com. I've got a painting blog there that's got loads of written painting tutorials, which you can copy, and I've got some reference photos there as well if you'd like to have a go at painting them. I also have full-length painting tutorial videos available from my website where I delve much deeper into a particular landscape or seascape, for example, and I'll show you the whole process from start to finish. So everything from the painting design, how to create the colors and values, also how to mix all of the colors which I demonstrate on my palette as well. Also, you can get instant access to all of these painting videos and more by subscribing to me on Patreon for just $5 a month or $51 a year where you save 15%. Each month you get a new full length painting tutorial video and access to all of my previous painting videos. Now, I've got over a year and a half worth of videos on here now which you can have instant access to. So my Patreon channel's pretty much like a landscape painting course. So this is great if you really wanna delve into landscape painting, particularly if you're a beginner or new to painting. There's all the information there. I also provide lesson notes and reference photos if you'd like to have a go at painting the landscapes and seascapes that are featured in the videos. Now, going back to my website, if you subscribe to my email list, I'm giving away a free ebook called Introduction to Oil Painting, where I give you information on the basics of oil painting, which paints to use, mediums, brushes, painting surfaces, how to clean your brushes, also links to websites where you can get art materials from, and inspiration such as ideas for paintings and composition. And I've also ended it with some sections on color theory, how to mix colors and how to understand the values. So I've put the links to all of these sites that I've mentioned in the description box below, so check that out. 
Now, I always find it quite difficult to know when to finish a painting. And quite often I'll finish a painting and I'll leave it for a few days or even a few weeks and I'll make some changes to it. I might see something that I've not seen before and I'm like, yeah, that needs changing. So with this particular painting, I ended it by adding some sheep in the field, just to add a bit of life to it. And I actually left this painting for quite a few months. And there was one thing in it that I wasn't particularly happy with and that was the trees in the corner. So I recently addressed that situation and it was a simple fix by just painting a few sky holes within the trees canopies and it just broke up that mass there and made them look a bit more realistic. So this is what the painting now looks like. So I hope you enjoyed this video and it inspires you to have a go at painting mountain landscapes. I love painting these types of landscapes and I think if you're new to painting landscapes that learning to paint mountains is a really good way of getting your head around understanding values within the landscape that you're painting. So I recommend giving it a go. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you in the next video.